All right, we can go ahead and get started. Uh, today we have Natalie Wolfenbarger here with us uh, doing her PhD talk. Uh, Natalie did her bachelor's of science at Cal California Polytechnic State University in aerospace engineering, and she got a master's in aerospace engineering here at UT, and then smartly decided to switch over to UTIG in the Institute of Geophysics, where she's been working uh, with Don Blankenship, Marquesa, and Krista Sutherland. Uh, at her time here, she's changed from characterizing spacecraft performance uh, to examining how data acquired by spacecraft can be used to better understand the Earth and other worlds, uh, particularly Europa. She's currently a graduate student affiliate member of the Europa Clipper Science Team, um, supporting verification and validation of the REASON instrument, which is an ice penetrating radar designed to look at Europa's ice shell. She's going to tell us about that today. I'm also going to be putting a link to a Google form in the chat so Natalie can be considered for the best PhD talk award this year. Take it away. Thank you, Erin, and thanks everyone for being here. Uh, as Erin said, I'm going to be presenting kind of a selection of some of the things I've been doing here at UTIG for the last couple of years. Um, I guess four or five years at this point, um, specifically related to uh, deriving terrestrial constraints on what we expect the distribution of brine to be in Europa's ice shell. So first I'm gonna give a brief introduction about ice radar and the search for life in the outer solar system um, and kind of introduce this motivating question that guided me throughout this process, which is, how can we use ice penetrating radar to constrain the habitability of Jupiter's icy moon Europa? Uh, so my research has fundamentally been motivated by the search for life beyond Earth. Uh, and what that means is I'm interested in understanding environments where we think we have these kind of key ingredients for life. That would be water, uh, which acts as a universal solvent, uh, energy to support an active metabolism. So this is things like uh, chemical energy or uh, generated through um, redox reactions, uh, as well as uh, building blocks that are important for kind of uh, constructing these molecules. Um, and as you can imagine, this is kind of a very broad and interdisciplinary field. It kind of exists in the intersection between uh, a bunch of different uh, areas of study, uh, things from glaciology, biology, chemistry, engineering. Um, so in pursuit of trying to find a tractable problem for my PhD, I decided to take a more focused approach. Um, and I chose to focus my research on exploring a, a specific target with a particular tool in support of an uncoupling mission. Uh, this target being uh, Jupiter's icy moon Europa, the tool being ice penetrating radar, and the mission being the upcoming uh, NASA Europa Clipper mission, which is intended to be launching in 2024. Uh, so something that you'll come across if you read any of these Europa papers is this kind of sentence of, it's the prime target in the search for habitable worlds in our solar system. Um, and for good reason, uh, we think it has these kind of uh, necessary ingredients for life. Um, and basically uh, water, is in the form of a global subsurface ocean that is thought to exist beneath the ice shell, uh, but also potentially water within the ice shell. Um, building blocks could be generated through interactions of the mantle and the ocean. Um, similarly, energy could be generated here as well, um, or through radiolytic processing of material at the surface, which if transported down into the ocean essentially serves as a potential source of food. Um, and a quick note is we're actually not sure whether the ice shell is in a convective state or in a conductive state, uh, but this does have implications for potential transport mechanisms as well and will become important in our assumed temperature profile later on. Uh, so why ice penetrating radar? Uh, one of the things that's great about ice penetrating radar is it can map the distribution of water in ice. Um, and so this is one of our uh, vertices of this habitability triangle. And to give you an idea of kind of what this looks like, uh, we have reflections that are produced by contrasts in the dielectric properties of ice. So here we see a reflection between the air-ice interface and the ice-ocean interface here. Uh, 
And this is an example of a radar gram that was uh, generated from data collected over Amory Ice Shelf in Antarctica. And you'll note here that there's a little bit of uh, what looks to be like missing data or um, reflection that we can't see. And I'm going to discuss the significance of that in the next slide. So uh, one of the things that I realized kind of looking at these um, you know, potential analog environments of these ice shelves is that uh, the characteristics of these reflections are fairly sen sensitive to the distribution of brine. And so you can think of the ocean as kind of a uh, brine volume fraction of one. We have ice and then you know, pure ocean water. Um, but we also, where we had this you know, echo free zone, when we were able to fly and collect data lower, this interface popped up. Um, and what this kind of essentially represents is kind of a briny ice mixture. Uh, this ice in particular is very low brine content, but you can see that it still produces a reflection. Uh, so what motivated kind of my research is understanding how we can kind of uh, connect these properties to eventually predict these signatures in Europa's ice shelf. Does it look like this or will it look like this? Can we detect it at all? And what does it mean if we do or don't? So the three chapters of my thesis are organized by um, trying to understand properties of Europa's ice shelf that will govern the detectability and characteristics of these potential radar signatures, but are not necessarily focused on the radar signatures themselves. So chapter one represents a publication that was recently accepted in astrobiology, hopefully will be published later this month, which is focused on this question of what is the bulk salinity of Europa's ice shell relative to the underlying ocean um, from the perspective of terrestrial analogs? Uh, the second chapter is uh, focused, it's currently in review at JGR Planets. I actually just got reviews earlier this week. Um, and it's focused on this question of how does the bulk salinity and the composition of salts control the distribution of brine, uh, specifically in a conductive ice layer. So this would either be the conductive lid overlying the convective ice shell or a conductive ice shell as a whole. And then finally, uh, the last chapter, which is in preparation for GRL, is focused on habitability metrics of these potential brine pockets. So examining what is it that actually will govern the habitability of these brine systems in Europa's ice shell, which is significant because if we can see these brine systems um, with the future Europa clip emission, this might represent uh, you know, the potential of detection of habitats. So I'm gonna jump right into chapter one, uh, which again is focused on this question of what is the bulk salinity of Europa's ice shell relative to the underlying ocean. Uh, so Europa's ice shell is very likely to have formed through the freezing of a sub-ice ocean, much like sea ice on earth. Um, and so consequently, uh, there have been some people who have applied sea ice models to this problem of Europa's ice shell. And hopefully this animation pay please. And you, what you should see is this kind of propagating ice shell as it's freezing, rejecting uh, concentrated salt and brine, where the white represents kind of the nominal ocean salinity, the blue represents a less saline ice, and the red is uh, more saline. And so this would represent things like um, concentrated brine channels. And so the main takeaways from this model is that salt is fairly efficiently rejected from ice's brine as, uh, ice, as the uh, ice shell is forming. Uh, the bulk salinity of this, of this sea ice is only a fraction of the ocean salinity. And it kind of lets us uh, consider, you know, this is a, a great model, but how do we actually expect this process to scale to ocean worlds? So one of the key distinctions between sea ice growth and ice shell, ice shell growth on Europa is the scales of these freezing processes, uh, where at Europa, we expect this to be a lot slower process than on Earth. So this kind of represents um, a summary of sea ice growth rates that are have been extracted from the literature. And we see in general, it falls between this range of 10 to the minus, minus four to 10 to the minus six centimeters per second. When we look at the modeled growth rates of Europa's ice shell, which we don't really have data for, so these are models, um, we see that they're orders of magnitude slower than sea ice growth rates on Earth. And the reason why this is actually significant is when you have ice that's growing very slowly, you're actually more efficient at rejecting salt. 
Uh, so here's kind of an example that illustrates this. On the x-axis, we have the growth rate of ice. On the y-axis, we have something called the solute distribution coefficient. What this represents is kind of the salinity of the ice normalized by the salinity of the ocean, where a lower value implies pure ice. And so this represents kind of a selection of sea ice data, again, extracted from the literature. Um, and you'll note that it's really only, uh, we only really have data within this kind of higher growth regime. Um, and that when we fit models to these data, we have kind of a strong deviation uh, down in the low growth velocities where we actually want to understand what the salinity is. Um, and so the solute distribution coefficient that governs this lower bound as the growth velocity approaches zero uh, can be referred to as uh, an equilibrium solute distribution coefficient. Uh, and in our case, it's kind of an effective quantity, um, but we're just gonna refer to it as that for now. So this is kind of the region we're interested in for the study. So we want to understand what processes are actually governing this quantity at these very low growth velocities. And one of the places that kind of approaches these conditions that we expect at Europa, or at least at the ice ocean interface, uh, is ice that forms beneath these ice shelves in Antarctica. And although these are uh, very difficult to obtain, there have been um, very few samples collected. Uh, we do actually have some samples, and these have been published throughout the literature, mostly to understand kind of ice ocean interactions in Antarctica and their eventual contribution to sea level rise, but it's also relevant to our problem. Um, I don't really have time <laughs> to discuss this, but uh, not all ice found beneath these ice shelves actually forms the same way. Um, but what I'm going to do is focus on a particular type of ice called congelation ice which is ice that forms through this kind of directional freezing process, um, similar to ice in your freezer, because we think that's probably a good analog for um, ice shell growth due to gradual cooling. So that's what I'm gonna focus on. So what we're gonna do is basically identify ice cores that have formed in this way uh, to extract what I'm gonna call a stable salinity from which we can derive this equilibrium distribution coefficient. Uh, so to give you kind of an idea of how this works, uh, this represents a salinity profile from an ice shell, excuse me, an ice core collected beneath a uh, Ross ice shelf. This is known as the J9 core. Um, I think it was collected in maybe the 1970s. Uh, but this right here, this area represents glacial ice. So this is meteoric origin. Um, but everything uh, below this uh, six meters from the base is all ice that's frozen directly to this ice shelf. And you'll note that it's kind of tapers off right here in salinity before increasing again. And this increasing tendency right here in salinity represents uh, the case of an actively growing ice. So when I say stable salinity, I mean this quantity right here. It's kind of uh, defined by it like almost this asymptote that uh, reflects the salinity of ice when it has stopped this desalination process. And so what's kind of cool about this ice core in particular is we have an estimate of what the growth rate is. And it does in fact fall within this growth velocity regime that we're interested in for Europa, which kind of tells us this might be something we can consider as an analog to understand these processes. So when I do extract a stable salinity, I end up getting something like 2.35 PPT. And when I normalize that by the ocean salinity, which is about 35 PPT, excuse me, PPT, um, which is, I should explain, parts per thousand uh, grams per kilogram of solution. Um, we get something around 7% in terms of like the efficiency of salt in drinking it. If we apply this same process to uh, the other ice cores that we were able to find in the literature, which again is very few, um, we end up seeing that the salinity in general falls between 1 and 5 ppt. Um, but you might also notice that Although this Ross ice shelf core is kind of uh, stable within two and four PPT, uh, the salinity of these two ice cores shows kind of a, um, a decrease near the surface. This is characteristic of a process called drainage metamorphism, where brine is basically redistributed throughout the ice due to melt. And so what that tells us was we should 
uh, kind of take these values with a grain of salt, pun absolutely intended. Um, so when we consider these ice cores, uh, even though we have kind of the potential for brine dis redistribution here, um, we see that in general, 7% is a, probably a good estimate for um, at least a maximum of what we expect the ice shell salinity to be relative to the ocean salinity. What's kind of interesting about this quantity is it's a little bit similar to this uh, percolation threshold that we think exists in sea ice of about 5%. And what I mean by a percolation threshold is as ice is desalinating, it goes through a phase where it's permeable and thus able to drain brine uh, to uh, transitioning to a brine volume fraction that is essentially impermeable, so desalination stops. So this kind of tells us that it's possible that a percolation threshold might actually govern the bulk salinity of Europa's ice shell. Something else to note is uh, this is really a mass fraction and this is a volume fraction. Uh, we don't expect them to be exactly the same, but the fact that they're close in magnitude suggests that they're likely related. Uh, so I'm gonna jump right in to chapter two, which is gonna be focused on how the bulk salinity and composition will control the brine in a conductive ice layer. Uh, so for pure ice, it's actually the pressure that determines uh, where melt is stable. Um, so this is kind of a classic uh, phase diagram. Uh, the black line represents the liquidus where um, ice 1H is stable um, here, and this is liquid water. Um, when we look at the expected uh, ice thicknesses at Europa, which is three to 38 kilometers thick for the ice shell, and on Earth, which could be up to three kilometers on the grounding line, we see that uh, there's actually significant overlap in terms of the range of pressures that are relevant to these bodies, uh, which again kind of like um, tells us that this is potentially a, a valid analog uh, on Earth uh, to use to understand these processes at Europa. When impurities are in present in the are present in the ice. It's actually the, the composition and bulk ice salinity, which will govern the amount of brine stable at a given temperature. So we don't have this single temperature that governs the distinction between solid and liquid. So here's an example of a phase diagram for seawater. And this is something that was derived from experimental data uh, back in uh, like the late 1950s. Um, and so if we want to model the brine volume fraction, uh, for this system as a function of bulk ice salinity and temperature, we need to account for the densities of the different phases, so the density of pure ice, but we also need to track things like the salinity of the brine, the density of the brine, and then also how the salts are partitioned. So whether they're in a dissolved state as ions or they're forming these solid salts as the solution is freezing. And so this was an approach originally developed by Cox and Weeks to model the brine volume fraction of sea ice, where they basically derive these phase behavior functions from the data and then generate empirical polynomial fits. So that way we're able to just kind of plug in these values and obtain a brine volume fraction as a function of temperature and bulk ice salinity. What I realized is um, although I'm not a chemist and I don't generate a lot of uh, data in terms of uh, how these solutions are freezing, the advent of these aqueous geochemistry tools, such as Freeze Chem or Freak, uh, will allow us to basically do these freezing experiments on our laptops. And so I realized that I can generate these phase behavior functions from models um, of simulated freezing provided by aqueous geochemistry software, um, as well as models for the pure ice density, which is also now able to be um, just done on a simple laptop. From that, I could model the volume fraction of brine and salt for essentially any system that could be modeled by geochemistry software. And so we validated this framework through a comparison to the contemporary model for sea ice 
And so this represents these kind of uh, polynomial fits that I spoke of before uh, that uh, essentially capture the freezing behavior as modeled by freeze chem. And so from these uh, fits, the phase behavior functions, we're able to model the brine volume fraction of saline ice. In this case, it's a 5 PPT sea ice. And the solid line represents our model, whereas the dashed line represents kind of the model that still exists today. Um, and this is a model derived from the data set that I showed you earlier um, from 1960. And one of the issues with that data set in particular is that it doesn't actually capture the true equilibrium freezing of sea ice, whereas our model does. So this, the, this distinction doesn't really come into effect at temperatures above minus 22 Celsius, uh, where a hydrohalite begins to precipitate. Uh, but below this, we see some de deviation. And I just want to note that that is expected. Uh, so essentially, what this does is it validates our approach to use uh, aqueous geochemistry software to generate these phase behavior functions. And so now we're able to kind of take this and apply this to models for the composition of salts in Europe, as I shall. So in order to apply this framework, we need to have uh, an understanding for a model for the temperature profile. And so what we're going to do is essentially adopt a linear temperature profile where the surface is at 100 Kelvin and the base is at zero degrees Celsius. Um, and we argue that this is probably a fairly decent uh, assumption to apply to both a conductive ice shell and a conductive lid. And part of the reason for that is in convective models of Europa's ice shell, even in the complete absence of salts, we see kind of uh, ubiquitous melt being generated in this layer, uh, which would have the effect of desalinating the ice. And so essentially what we're doing is saying the salinity, the bulk salinity of the ice shell is really preserved in this upper layer. Uh, so that's what we're going to do for a temperature profile. Uh, it also maximizes the distribution of the vertical distribution of brine in a shell. Um, whereas if we adopted something like 50 Kelvin, which would be maybe the polar temperature of Europa, we're gonna get like a thinner layer. So this is our best case. Um, we're going to assume uh, two compositions for the salts in Europa's ice shell. Uh, this is something that we don't have um, a great understanding of currently, but there's kind of two N-member compositions that are often considered for the ocean and uh, presumably that's the ice shell, and that is a chloride-dominated composition and a sulfate-dominated composition. Uh, these are kind of extracted from spectroscopic observations of salts on the surface, as well as geochemical models. So what we're going to do is kind of adopt analog compositions similar to um, oceans that we know or can model. So the first um, is the chloride-dominated case. We're going to basically adopt terrestrial seawater. Um, and in the second, for the sulfate dominated case, I'm going to adopt a sulfate dominated ocean that was modeled by Zoltov and Schock. I'm going to only consider four ionic impurities, and this is kind of to simplify the system, um, as well as kind of ensure that the geochemistry software is giving us results that we can trust, um, which is a whole other topic um, to discuss. Uh, so, Although we're assuming the same kind of uh, concentration of impurities here, uh, it's really these molar ratios that are different. And um, because of the way that we're deriving these phase behavior functions, uh, the salinity that we assume is kind of irrelevant because it can scale over the whole region where brine is stable. So now we are going to apply this approach to Europa's ice shell, considering both our chloride end member and our sulfate end member. And this is what we get. It's kind of a lot. I'm going to walk you through it. The blue color bar represents the brine volume fraction, where one represents a pure liquid and zero is pure ice, or at least no liquid. Uh, the red represents a salt volume fraction. Uh, you'll notice although the brine volume fraction goes from zero to one, the salt volume fraction is kind of capped at some upper limit. This is governed by the uh, eutectic concentration. Um, so this is going to be composition dependent, which is why it's different in these two cases. Uh, we have temperature increasing downwards, much like Europa's ice shell, where the surface is capped at that 100 Kelvin. Uh, 
Um, and it's the same profile assumed in both of these cases. The x-axis is the bulk ice salinity, and we're going to consider a range uh, ranging from zero, which would be pure ice, all the way up to the eutectic uh, salinity of the brine. So that's right before it goes from liquid to pure solid, um, where brine is no longer stable. And so that eutectic temperature is uh, depicted as a dashed line in both of these plots. You'll notice that it actually shares a eutectic temperature. And what that means is for temperatures below this point, brine is not stable. You'll have salt and ice. And you can kind of see that in the color bar as well. The black line represents the brine salinity as a function of temperature. And this is going to become lit, uh, important later on. Uh, the same with this dashed line, which is basically represents a brine volume fraction of 0 0.05. And so this, that's just the value um, associated with the percolation threshold for sea ice. And so we now kind of have an idea of what we expect the brine volume fraction to be in Europa's ice shell given these different parameters. Um, so next we're going to kind of use these to understand um, things about the ice shell. And so one of the things I was interested in is how can we use these results to understand what that stable bulk ice shell salinity should be? Because before, as I pointed out, it's likely governed by a percolation threshold, which is a critical brine volume fraction. And so that would be that dashed line right here. So what I realized is we can actually use this framework to estimate a stable bulk ice shell salinity. And I'm gonna walk you through this for the case of terrestrial sea ice. So we have brine volume fraction here, increasing towards the right, temperature uh, increasing upwards. Um, this blue region right here represents the temperature range where seawater is not freezing. It's just doing its thing. Uh, this is the freezing temperature for seawater, the lower boundary of this box, um, for an ocean that's 35 ppt. So that's terrestrial seawater. Each one of these curves is a brine volume fraction curve for an assumed bulk ice salinity. So we're considering bulk ice salinities from one to 35. These black arrows are basically representing a desalination pathway for ice. So if you think about how seawater is forming ice, you start with like an ice of 35 ppt, but gradually desalinate um, as the ice is forming. And so this represents specifically a desalination pathway for ice that's going to end up at 5 ppt. And what basically is happening is as you cross this line, which is at 5%, so 0.05, you transition from a permeable ice brine system to an impermeable ice brine system. So here you can desalinate, but here you're stuck on your curve. And so what I realized is uh, sea ice of 5 ppt is kind of uh, typical of what we think the salinity of sea ice is. But if you can imagine freezing extremely slowly, so a very low temperature gradient, what you could essentially do is travel on this pathway, right, where you're slowly desalinating up until the point where you become impermeable. So essentially what I was interested in is what is the bulk ice salinity that will intersect right here at the freezing temperature of the ocean and this critical porosity, which governs this transition between permeable and impermeable ice. And so that's what this 1.95 curve is. So we end up getting a stable bulk ice salinity of 1.95. What we can then do is scale this process to any ocean salinity, because all we're really doing is changing things like the freezing temperature of the solution, which here it's minus two, but for uh, an ocean salinity of 40 could be minus three. Um, off the top of my head, I don't actually know. Uh, but the important part is, is when we do this analysis and we consider a range of ocean salinities, we end up with this almost linear relationship where this red dot here is basically this value here. And so this is actually, if you'll notice, see the salinity of ice over the salinity ocean which goes back at this quantity we were interested in initially of 0 0.058. So notably, this is a little bit lower than the value that I derived for the, con or the ice cores uh, previously, um, but this could also be uh, 
an artifact of just assuming that it's the freezing temperature of the solution as opposed to some lower temperature. Um, but it's uh, still kind of compelling that we can derive this constraint, which would kind of represent a, a minimum bulk ice shell salinity governed by a certain percolation threshold, which in our case is 0 0.05. However, we don't need to use 0 0.05. We can consider a range of different percolation thresholds. And so that's what we did, considering 0.01 to 0.1. And you can see that this is fairly linear as well. Um, but also importantly, not super sensitive to composition either. You end up getting kind of deviations as you get to this higher uh, critical porosity governing your percolation threshold. Uh, but this kind of lended credence to both this approach and this idea of um, using a percolation threshold to constrain what we expect that bulk ice salinity to be. And so although we have 0.05 as kind of a percolation threshold for sea ice on Earth, it's very possible that in the slow growth conditions expected at Europa, the actual morphology of this ice ocean interface can slowly evolve to something that's a little more planar. And the effect of that will be reducing this percolation threshold. So I think a critical line of work is to experimentally constrain this process better. And the significance of this is um, you can kind of tie this back into those numerical models, um, such as the sea ice growth model that I showed previously. So moving on to chapter three, uh, what governs the habitability of brine systems in Europa's ice shell? So uh, when we look at brines on Earth, there are certain geochemical limitations for um, whether or not these brine systems can serve as habitats, one of which is temperature. Uh, this isn't a hard limit that, in general, we don't think life can grow uh, temperatures colder than minus 20 C, but it seems to be kind of uh, a, a trend that it, it becomes harder to grow below minus 20. Um, one of the reasons for this is uh, basically something called vitrification of the cellular interior. It becomes uh, kind of unable to transport uh, necessary nutrients through the membrane. Water activity, uh, there's a limit on this, a lower limit of 0 0.6, which has been derived again empirically looking at life on Earth, where below this water activity, we don't think life can grow and reproduce. Water activity essentially is the thermodynamic availability of water as the definition. I like to think about it as the accessibility of water to life. Um, like if it's in the form of ice, it's not accessible. Um, and then another important constraint on water activity is that my, most micros can't really multiply below a water activity of 0 0.9. So this kind of region between 0 0.6 and 0 0.9 would be what we consider like extremophilic organisms. So that's where all of this extremophile research becomes kind of important. Brine salinity doesn't have a hard limit in terms of where we have seen life and not seen life. Uh, however, it is a stressor that can cause proteins to precipitate. This is kind of almost similar to like a salt solubility issue, um, as well as cells to dehydrate um, due to osmotic stress. Ionic strength is an important factor that has been considered in analog studies of uh, Martian brine systems, so potential analogs for something like that. Uh, where uh, a limit was derived of about 10 moles per liter. I will say subsequent research has kind of um, raised this limit, but it does appear to be pretty composition dependent. Uh, one of the issues with ionic strength of the solution is it has the effect of kind of perturbing the structure and function of biological molecules. And this kind of intuitively makes sense from the perspective of just like what charges can do to like polarized or, or like polar materials. So this is, um, kind of an example of how you can look at these habitability metrics for brine systems on Earth. And so this is work by uh, actually one of my co-authors um, on this particular chapter, um, looking at the habitability of different brine systems, looking at different geochemical factors. And so what he found was that basically the confluence of water activity and ionic strength seem to govern uh, what brine systems were habitable. And so that's what's represented by the green. And so we decided to kind of take a similar approach to our Europa brine system problem 
except instead of using uh, specific analogs, we use geochemistry software, particularly freeze, uh, specifically freeze chem. So from freeze chem, we were able to generate these plots, which represent uh, temperature versus water activity, brine solidity, and ionic strength, three of those factors, that, well, I guess all four of those factors that we just considered in the previous slide. Uh, the black line here I've denoted as the water activity of 0 0.9. This is kind of the boundary of uh, governing where extremophiles kind of, um, I guess it'd be psychrophiles and halophiles, so cold loving and salt loving organisms um, might uh, exist or be happy, I guess, uh, their optimal conditions. And uh, this black line here is representing the temperature where this kind of boundary occurs. Uh, importantly, we can see that it's really um, the eutectic temperature. You probably can't see it, but I'll explain. It's the eutectic temperature that's governing kind of uh, what the water activity of a given solution is kind of going to be. Uh, so in the case of magnesium sulfate, that has a very low eutectic temperature. So although uh, um, the water activity never even falls below 0 0.9, this is where it will transition um, to below the eutectic temperature and brine will no longer be stable. So because these two share a eutectic temperature, as I said before, we end up kind of capped at a water activity um, of, I think it's around 0 0.75. Um, at the eutectic. So importantly, uh, we have yeah, a temperature of minus 11 that uh, characterizes the transition to like the extremophile regime. Um, and it never really falls below this lower limit of 0 0.6. If we were to extrapolate this curve, uh, it would suggest that a solution where the uh, where brine could be stable down to minus 51 C, uh, you might run into this problem where water activity is kind of governing your habitability of your brine system. Um, similarly, with ionic strength, we have that limit of 10 moles uh, per liter. It never really falls below that either for these candidate systems, suggesting that's also likely not a driver for the habitability of these brines. Um, and again, with the brine salinity, there's not really a hard limit, um, but you can see already, even where the water activity is kind of high, um, you still have these kind of challenging salty environments. Um, I forgot to do that. Oh uh, yeah, and so an important takeaway from this is like, although we're not really exceeding these kind of earth-derived limits, these combinations of high salinity and ionic strength at low water activity is stressful. And so organisms need to develop strategies to survive these environments. Um, sea ice is kind of an analog system for this on earth. Um, and organisms who inhabit those environments have kind of developed these strategies to endure these geochemical extremes. One of which is the accumulation or synthesis of what's called compatible solutes. And so these are ions like potassium or organic molecules like sugars that can be either synthesized or accumulated um, in the interior to kind of decrease osmotic stress. So preventing water from being forced um, out of the cell or salts into the cell, I guess. Um, and then also the synthesis of something called extracellular polysaccharide substances, um, which has and antifreeze proteins, which have the effect of essentially modifying the ice structure and inhibiting ice recrystallization. And so this is important if you've got like, you know, um, ice crystals, which are like coming into, you know, your habitat and you want to preserve that habitat um, so that you can you know, occupy that space and grow and reproduce. And so this is actually a really cool figure that demonstrates the effect that EPS has on ice, where you can see that we have pretty nice uniform brine pockets in the absence of EPS, um, but there's kind of an increase in tortuosity um, where we have an abundance of EPS. And part of the effect of this is actually to retain salts and brine in the ice. An important takeaway from this, though, is that although we know organisms can adapt to these environments, these are strategies which require nutrients and energy to persist. So one of the things I decided to do is kind of consider classifying these potential habitats based on nutrient availability. 
And so this is not something that, you know, uh, came out of nothing. Previous work has done this on Earth, basically demonstrating that you can group metabolic rates based on nutrient availability. And so this is kind of a survey of uh, habitats on Earth that are inhabited by um, extremophiles and in some cases non-extremophiles, um, where growth metabolic rate is characterized by an unlimited access to nutrients. Matri maintenance is uh, you have a nutrient availability that's uh, sufficient, but too low for growth. And then finally, survival is kind of the minimum that you would need to repair macular, macro, macromolecular damage. So instead of using these kind of metabolic rates, I decided to kind of take the perspective of looking at efficiency of nutrient transport itself in terms of the permeability of ice. Um, and going back to our previous discussion, we had uh, noted that the permeability of ice seems to drop off at this percolation threshold. So essentially what I decided to do is classify habitats based on brine volume fraction, where active habitats represent the region where nutrient transports can occur by a convection of the brine and exchange of seawater at the ice ocean interface. And so this is characterized by a brine volume fraction above this critical porosity. Dormant habitats would be those where brine is stable, but fundamentally nutrient transport would have to occur by a diffusion along interstitial uh, boundaries. Uh, since uh, convection is not uh, possible at that um, percolation threshold. And then finally, relic habitats, uh, essentially where brine is, or excuse me, liquid water is not stable, which will challenge the nutrient transport and uptake, but in some works has argued not to necessarily prevent it. Uh, but in our work, we're going to just adopt this classification. So going back to our um, brine distribution model. This dotted line, again, represents uh, where the brine volume fraction equals this critical porosity over a range of temperatures um, and for different bulk ice salinities. So if you were to look at it from the perspective of this parameter space, dormant habitats would be all those with the brine volume fraction lower than this critical porosity, and active habitats would be all those above that critical porosity. Um, and everything below this eutectic temperature of, I think it's like minus 32, represents relic habitats. Um, there was one other thing I wanted to say. Uh, ah, so what this kind of shows is that if you had a high enough bulk ice salinity, uh, you could potentially have an entire, you know, region of the ice shell up until this temperature, which could be characterized as an active habitat. However, we started this talk basically saying, we don't think the bulk ice salinity should be this high. It should be probably somewhere around here. So what we're really interested in is looking at the fraction of this layer that is going to be experiencing this desalination process. Um, and so in sea ice, this is referred to as the mushy layer. And thankfully, uh, another one of my co-authors has actually derived an equation for the thickness of a mushy layer to basically capture what portion of the ice shell do we expect to be in this convective uh, driven desalinating state. So what we did is we basically decided to account for the actual properties of the brine derived from the freeze chem, um, where we can consider specifically the role of composition. And so you can see the dash line is what Buffo et al assumed while the dots with the colors are what we were able to drive from freeze chem. And so accounting for these brine properties, we will able to derive a mushy layer thickness for an ice shell of 10 kilometers is just something we assume that's probably fairly representative of the thickness of a conductive ice shell or a conductive lid. Um, the black dot represents the value that uh, he derived for his uh, seawater case. Um, and the important takeaway of this is this is really only a few meters at the very base of the ice shell, uh, which is not great for our understanding of where active habitats might actually exist. So there is one other point that I think is important to make here is that this is really only in existence if the ice shell is actively thickening, because once it's done freezing, you're basically going to be at a point where you're at a stable salinity lower than that percolation threshold to begin with. So um, this kind of gives us an idea of 
when we're going to look for biosignatures, what are we actually looking for? If we're looking near the surface or even in the ice shell interior, perhaps we shouldn't expect to see things swimming around in brine pockets. So conclusions and future work. Um, uh, the con major conclusion of chapter one related to at least this talk is that the bulk salinity of Europa's ice shell is likely governed by a percolation threshold and likely doesn't exceed 7% of the underlying ocean salinity. Uh, chapter two, um, for the same temperature and bulk salinity, the brine volume fraction in a chloride dominated shell, which was the one to the left, and the uh, sulfate dominated shell, which is the one to the right, uh, the chloride dominated shell is higher than the sulfate. Um, the stable bulk ice shell salinity can be represented as a function of the percolation threshold and is relatively insensitive to the composition impurities, which kind of motivates future experimental work on the subject. And finally, the takeaways from chapter three, um, brine pockets in Europa's ice shell do not appear to be geochemically prohibitive to life as we know it, suggesting that they could serve as potential habitats. Um, and that brine volume fraction may be the critical factor determining uh, the habitability of the shell, given its role in nutrient transport and recycling. Um, and this is, again, particularly important in terms of the classification of these habitats, where a lot of these are likely to be uh, essentially dormant. Um, and in terms of future work, I intend to kind of get back to this question of how can we use ice penetrating radar to constrain the habitability of Jupiter's moon and uh, Europa, <laughs> not all of them. Uh, so one of these projects is uh, examining potential reflections from salt layers as a signature of ocean salinity. This is a project that I actually started here with um, a bunch of other people in the polar planetary group that I hope to finish. Um, looking at reflections from a eutectic interface. This is the interface that characterizes where brine is not stable versus where brine is stable and how that can be used as a signature of ice shell salinity. Because remember the bulk ice salinity controlled the brine volume fraction at a given temperature. And finally, looking at potential reflections from subsumed iogenic material. Uh, because this material is uh, sulfuric acid rich, there's the potential that the uh, ice penetrating radar could be sensitive to that. And if we are able to detect that, that represents a signature of surface ice shell exchange, which is important for study, studies of habitability. Because as I mentioned before, there's this uh, potential source of oxidants at the surface that if deposited into the ocean could serve as a source of food. So thank you for listening. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to ask now or contact me. Um, at my email listed there. Yeah, thank you, Natalie. Awesome work. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to unmute yourself or you can type them in the chat and I can read them out as well. Hey, Natalie, Ms. Duncan, it's uh, really, really great to see all this uh, coming together. Um, I guess um, a question I have is uh, there's kind of, you know, the two possible end members of how you make the ice shell. Um, one is it's a steady state phenomenon. It's always been at the same kind of thickness. Or you start off from some point where it's very minimal thickness and grow up from that point. Um, what would you, for the first phase of that, if it was uh, this kind of starting from a very minimal thickness, would you expect the salinities in the top layers of the ice shelf, shelf to maybe be higher and then reduce in salinity as, as the, the freezing rate goes down, as the, the, the great temperature gradient basically reduces? That's a really good question. Um, one of the models that I actually ran was kind of something called the, just the Stefan problem which is a 1D solidification model where you impose a temperature boundary condition. So I did that imposing like a temperature of 100 Kelvin. And what you end up seeing is below approximately like a couple hundred meters, you already enter into this kind of like asymptotic salinity regime. So it's possible that you could have this very rich salt layer in the 
the top couple hundred meters. Uh, but I actually realistically don't necessarily expect that to take place because we assume like a temperature boundary condition when in reality it would be like a flux boundary condition kind of governing the loss of heat that would drive this process. So I think, um, yeah, there's potential for a thin salt layer, but I don't necessarily think it would exist in practice. Thanks. Hi, Natalie, this is Don. Uh, chapter three is moving pretty fast there. And I was trying to keep track of the ramifications of fragile, fragile ice. In, in other words, something that's well drained. Could you kind of go over that for me? Yeah, totally. Um, so for context for everyone else, uh, frazzle ice is that other type of ice that I didn't talk about. And this forms through the precipitation of kind of these um, pure ice crystals that look like little platelets that form in a super cold water column and kind of collect at an interface and then consolidate as opposed to growing from that interface. Uh, and one of the implications of this process is the bulk salinity of this ice is actually a lot lower. So from the perspective of like a mushy layer where nutrients can be exchanged, it, it doesn't really appear to be like as good of a habitat. Um, again, constrained by nutrient delivery. However, one of the interesting things about frazzle ice is you actually can maintain a very high permeability ice layer in the unconsolidated portion. Um, so although the ice is like lower salinity, it has a much higher permeability um, just because it's unconsolidated. So in that environment, you might actually expect it to be kind of a more beneficial habitat, even though it's a lower ice salinity. Um, and there's also the added benefit of this ice kind of preferentially of forms where there's, um, you know, rifts and basal fractures where you have steep gradients in the basal topography of the ice. And so that would also bring it closer to the surface where potentially it's more accessible. Um, so from the perspective of bulk salinity, you would think, oh, this is like maybe not as good of a habitat for nutrient transport, but in the unconsolidated layer, it would be. Again, noting that the geochemical limitations don't appear to be prohibitive to life. So it's this nutrient availability and transport that we're focusing on. Does that make sense, Don? Yeah, no, and I'm thinking, yeah, you know, and, and what I'm trying to do, my problem is I'm, I don't have an innate transfer function to the three constraints on habitability, you know, and, and I'm really trying to think you know, really trying to think what easy drain, you know, big thickness of easy drain really, really does to those three constraints. Um, obviously, is it, are you, and the big question is, is are you going to stick that in the habitability paper? Or are you going to leave that for further work? Further work, there's, it's a, we're trying to fit this into like a GRL format. GRL, no, our, yeah, not my point, yes. <laughs> yes. So yes, I think it's point. important and I want to write about it, um, but yeah, probably not in this particular manuscript. Yeah, okay. I was going to say, because I can't imagine, because, you know, uh, there's going to be so much packed in there to, and, and that's going to be so interesting, you know, with so many little alleys to go down for, for expansion habitable zones heterogeneous expansion of habitable zones. Anyway, that was, uh, that. That was my thought. Yeah, and yeah, the one thing I'd like to add is that one of the things I didn't talk about is there's this hypothesis for what we call perched lakes in the ice shell, um, which are these potential ocean injected reservoirs that would exist um, kind of higher up. And so if these are indeed ocean injected, um, as they freeze, these also kind of would represent potential habitable environments. So you have this um, you know, layer at the very base where the ice shell is actually actively thinking, which could be active habitats, but also this layer in a freezing uh, perch lake that could also represent um, active habitats because you have that potential for nutrient exchange, although your reservoir is maybe more confined in terms of um, supply of nutrients. Although I don't think intuitively that's like a driver, so. Yeah, another I, thing for future work. <laughs> yeah, I had to choose which one of those questions to ask. So, so perch lakes don't fall. There's no specific parameter that puts perch lakes in the dormant category. 
it's really, again, the limited access to nutrients that would do it. And if you had like really, really and truly an injected ocean reservoir that could probably serve as a source of nutrients for the entire process yeah. of the freezing. So nothing, those are just, nothing yeah. physical, just, just chemical. I think, well, yeah, nothing, nothing geochemical, just uh, nutrient accessibility. Yeah. Okay. Hi, Natalie. Can I ask a quick question? Um, I just wanted to know, maybe you said it and I just missed it, but how is this percolation threshold constrained? How is it determined and how well is it constrained? And I was wondering if you would have, you know, uncertainties on this percolation threshold, how that would impact your results. That's a really great question. Um, so a lot of this work on a percolation threshold in sea ice was derived from yeah, early studies of sea ice, particularly by um, Golden et al. Um, and it's actually still something that's kind of uh, discussed and studied today. Um, I think the benefit of uh, kind of constraining what we expect this percolation threshold to be at very low growth velocities would be, um, yeah, again, constraining what that stable bulk salinity would be. Um, and so uh, Sonka Mouse is another person who I think is um, actively working on this process of constraining a percolation threshold um, for growing sea ice and old sea ice. Um, it's, it's still actively in work today and um, it has been for decades now. But the 0.05 seems to be pretty, when you use that as a percolation threshold, your results from these CIS desalination models appear to be uh, well representing salinity profiles in ice cores. So there's a lot of justification for that 5% here on earth. Okay, but so it is, it is still an empirical, kind of an empirical determination or is it like determined from models of freezing and stuff like that? Uh, kind of both. Um, there's an empirical component to this that kind of motivated some even like theoretical studies of uh, like percolation theory that was able to identify this 5%. Um, there's quite a bit of literature on the subject, but I didn't have really time to include it all here. But I think in the future, I might include it as backup to uh, address this very important point. Okay, thank you. I think that's just about all the time we have. Um, so thank you, Natalie. Once again, the Google form for uh, Natalie's talk is in the chat. Um, this is also the last UTIC discussion hour of the semester. So thank you everyone for coming and we'll see you in the fall. Thanks, Aaron.